Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video we'll be doing the book The Abyssal Plain, The Relay Cycle. This book was published in 2019 and it consists of four stories. The first is Ammonia by William Halloway which is the one we will be doing in this video. The second is A Sunken Desert by Michelle Garza and Melissa Larson. The third is The Rise and the Fall by Brett Tully and the fourth is The Great Beast by Rich Hawkins. These last three stories will be in upcoming videos. Before we continue, please subscribe, give us a like, drop us a comment, and now Ammonia. Our story begins with Quincy. Quincy is an alcoholic and a failed musician who has been kicked out of every band he's ever been in. His alcoholism is so bad that he's unable to go to sleep without being drunk and there are times when he can't get up to go to the bathroom, so he urinates on himself. And on this, the last night of human peace, he's having a recurring nightmare. He's dreaming of a flood. Sometimes he's an ant, and the water rushes down the corridors of the ant hill and drowns everyone. Sometimes he's a cat, and he's in the branches of a tree as the water rushes out to the river. He wakes up from his nightmare, shouting, there are millions of them. He then reaches and grabs the remains of his warm bear and drains it before falling out of bed and hitting his head. He lost his job because he was too drunk to go, so now he needs to go and get beer and cigarettes since he's out of both, so he heads to the Habib store to get some. A few weeks before, between Australia and South America in the South Pacific, a ballistic missile submarine called the USS Georgia was on station. They were there tracking two Russian subs that were somewhere close to Indonesia. That was when they detected a spike in the background radiation that was passing through the water. They quickly checked to make sure that it wasn't coming from any of their missiles or reactor. It seemed to be cosmic background radiation, but it wasn't coming from space where it should have been. It was coming from the bottom of the ocean far to their south. That's when a serious buffering hit the Georgia that damaged it and forced it to surface and send out a distress signal. The submarine was damaged and the missile tubes were bent, so now the submarine was no longer combat effective. Captain Clark and his exo his nickname Bamboo was on the cannon tower looking to the south. The captain was looking through his binoculars. In the skies above them was about a hundred F-18s that were on guard waiting until the rest of the Pacific fleet showed up. Captain Clark told Bamboo that he had spoken to the defense secretary and two admirals so far and that they overheard a message from the Russian typhoon that said the epicenter of the event, as they're calling it, happened under the Ross ice shelf. Bamboo asked him why didn't they call it an earthquake, and he asked him what does McMurdo Station say. That's when Captain Clark told him that McMurdo Station is no longer there. The ice shelf had fractured and was now floating in the southern ocean. Bamboo had a hard time believing that since this part of the world is supposed to be geologically stable. The captain pointed to the billions of dead fish floating around them and said, tell that to those guys. Near them on the horizon was an NOAA research ship called the Sea Lion that didn't seem to have been damaged. The captain then told him that the Norwegians said that a meteor had hit the ice shelf, but Bamboo didn't believe that because he thought any meteor that would do that would have been bigger than Tunguska and people would have seen the flash and heard the blast. Also in the area was a dead sperm whale, and the sea lion radioed the Georgia asking for permission to hop in a speedboat and go and check out the carcass. And Captain Clark said, okay, as long as they had an escort. And he sent bamboo to escort them. As the effects of the event crept across the globe, Natalie was having her own problems. She was a journalist, and her problem was her boss, who she'd been having an affair with for the last three years because she loved him, although she knew that he didn't love her and that he was never going to leave his wife. And now she was debating whether to let the Speaker of the House have his way. He had propositioned her right outside the Oval Office. 
the media had a habit of covering for the speaker and sweeping whatever he did something wrong under the rug. When Natalie came back out of the bathroom, there was a man who introduced himself as Chester Slayton from the NOAA with him. She asked him if he was here because of the aurora and the earthquake, and he told her that they wasn't even sure that it was an earthquake or some other kind of geomagnetic phenomena. He went on to say that the Ross Ice Shelf was now an island and was moving north. The speaker, of course, was not listening to what he was saying. He was just trying to figure out how to use this to push his agenda in Congress. Meanwhile, Natalie's boss, Irwin, wanted her to have sex with the speaker in order to advance both of their careers. Later, she was in Irwin's car, briefing him on her meeting with the speaker and Slayton of the NOAA. By now, she was tired and wanted to go home. Irwin told her that sometimes you got to break all the rules by any means necessary. And she got a bit annoyed and told him that, Irwin, you're married and now you think that I should have sex with another man. How the hell do you do it? And he said, this is DC. It's not about loyalty. Bamboo was not too impressed with the researchers on the NOAA vessel. So far, they hadn't told him anything that he didn't already know. By now, they were next to the sperm whale that was male and hadn't been dead for a long time, probably at the same time of the event. Watkins, the one scientist in the raft who was a marine biologist, said that the whale's name was Waldo III. It seems that it was in a fight with a giant squid before the event broke its back and killed it. So that's when Jackson, who was the pilot of the boat, asked the doctor why would the wave kill Waldo but not the squid. Quincy was half asleep. He was thinking about how the world was denying him the greatness that he was born to be. Susie had come over last night with a bottle. Now she was gone and all he saw was the empty bottle. He knew that today was going to suck. He had tried to wake up earlier, but his hands shook too bad for him to lock the door behind him. He had tried to eat some peanut butter, but he brought it back up. And now he was lying on the floor next to the toilet. This is humiliating, but he never examines himself too closely because it gives him anxiety attacks and heart palpitations. It happened before and he ended up in the hospital. He stayed in for four days until he was out of booze and pills. Then he decided to go to the Habib store to stock up. When he got downstairs, he noticed that the intersection was flooded. He hadn't seen this type of flooding in Austin before. Susie's yellow cami was still in the parking lot. The doors were open, so he got in, and the key was in the ignition, so he started up, and he figured he was going to drive it to the store. But then the smell hit him. The car smelled like ammonia, almost made him want to vomit, so he preferred walking instead. Quincy always felt bad at taking advantage of Raj, who would always spot him a bear when he was broke, and he knew it came out of his own pocket. And most of the time, he never paid him back. When he got to the store, it was dark and quiet. No lights, no music, no nothing. He called out to Raj, but got no answer. And it smelled like they had mopped the place with ammonia. He figured that maybe the rain and the flooding was keeping people away. And Lady Bird Johnson's lake had overbreached its banks several nights in a row. He left and went to the next door laundromat to see if Raj was in there, but he wasn't there, so he went back to the store. He grabbed a brown paper bag and wrote a note to Raj on it, telling him that he was short on funds and he's going to have to get back with him for the smokes and the bear that he's taken. He then headed back to his apartment. There was nobody on the street, and as he's walking down the empty street, he hears a truck horn, and it was Luz Marie in her taco truck. She rolled up to him and told him that every single work site is empty. She hasn't sold anything today. That by this time, she's usually calling to get her people to bring her a second batch. She said even at the elementary school, it was empty. There was only five kids and a teacher. So he invited her to come upstairs with him and have a few cold ones. But she didn't stick around. She looked around his apartment, took one look at his bed, then left, yelling at him to take a shower. So he cursed at her and sat down and tried not to think about the life that could have been his. Because everybody looks down on him, except junkies. Because he pisses himself every night and he can't hold on to anything. Then he hears a man screaming in Spanish. And then gunshots. Eleven shots fired. Up close. So he runs and he peeps out the window. 
He doesn't see anything, nothing at all. The streets was well lit. There were no one on the balconies, no one outside looking to see what happened. This wasn't a ghetto, so people should have been out looking to see what was happening, but there was nothing. So he opened his front door and listened, and then went out on the balcony. There was no neighbors, no nothing. He began to wonder. It's impossible that he's the only one that heard that. So he went out and began knocking on neighbors' doors. Nobody answered. He tried one. It was open. It was dark inside. He announced himself, got no answer, and then smelled that ammonia smell once again and closed the door. Then he heard a sound as if something was being dragged between the ceiling and the roof. So he went back to his apartment and locked the door. He took a chair, stood on it so he could push open the utility door and look inside the crawl space in the ceiling. And he got a blast of that ammonia smell in his face. He quickly dropped the door and almost vomited. Went and grabbed a cold one. Went out on the balcony where he heard that dragon sound again, this time on the roof. He went downstairs and looked back at his apartment building. His was the only light that was on in the whole place. There was no music, no sound of any televisions. The parking lot was filled. He stepped backwards and fell over into a puddle and saw the gun with all the spent shell casings all around. That's when it really began to rain. He went back upstairs and in the next several hours drank almost a case of beer and smoked a pack of cigarettes. He needed to go back to the store to get more beer because if he didn't, he wouldn't be able to go to sleep. So he went back downstairs. Everything down there was the same. He headed back to the store. This time the power was on. But there was nobody in there, and his note was still sitting on the counter. He yelled for Raj and heard nothing. He held his breath, ran into the store, grabbed two packs and another case of beer, and headed out. His hands were shaking too much for him to write a note. And as he's headed back to his apartment, he heard his name being called when he looked around, he saw it was Dave McMaster, Junkie Dave. He told Dave, maybe I prefer to be alone. But Dave told him, nah, brother, we stand amidst splendor and riot, the beginning and the end. The stars are right, and you and me, we're here to serve. The USS Emery S. Land had come from Guam and picked up most of the crew, leaving just a skeleton crew aboard the Georgia. Whatever the event was, it had caused the ring of fire to erupt. The Pacific Rim was a wasteland. The West Coast was in ruins. There was devastation from Alaska to Cape Horn. New Zealand and Hawaii had just about ceased to exist. Bamboo knew it was not an earthquake no matter what they were telling people. And he was spending a lot of his time trying to figure out what it was. In the meanwhile, the Emory S. Land had removed all of the missiles from the Georgia. When the captain came and asked him if he figured it out, he said no, not even a hydrogen bomb had enough power to do what it did. And he, the captain told him that the Swedes think it was a volcano. But Bamboo told him that doesn't explain the blast of radiation they detected. And the captain told him the only ones who know about that blast of radiation was the Joint Chiefs and you and I. Bamboo told him that the blast was like nothing he's never seen before. It was a blast of radiation that was combined with a black hole noise. And nothing does that. The captain then told him that the NOAA team and the Sea Lion wanted to speak to him again. So over he went. Once he got there, they took him to see the marine biologist Watkins, who showed him a dead giant squid. Watkins then asked him, did you know that there's no such thing as a freshwater cephalopod? He goes on to say that this one can go upstream. A shockwave didn't kill the squid and neither did the radiation. The radiation should have cooked them, but it didn't. Watkin goes on to tell him that Waldo the whale would have died from radiation poisoning if the shark wave didn't kill him first, but the squid wasn't harmed by either. And he goes on to say that there are metabolic changes and other processes at work even now in this specimen. Something is changing the squid, like it's being programmed to be something else. He goes on to say that he thinks that the blast of radiation was a code, a signal that activated something dormant in the genome of the squid. Something or someone has reprogrammed this squid. He thinks this one, if it was still alive, would be at home in fresh water and it could probably leave the water for brief periods. He suspects that it could probably camouflage itself like an octopus. That's when Bamboo asked him how many of these things are there. Quincy and Dave sat in front of Quincy's building 
drinking and smoking. Dave was talking about the rapture of the deep and how he doesn't think God is God anymore, that there's a new sheriff in town. There were times when Dave seems to know what Quincy was thinking. Dave told him we are open book to one another. All the secrets and the lies have been laid bare, and it's all an illusion anyway. Dave goes on to say, the world, society, you and me, we are failures in that world. Outcasts, losers, nobodies and pieces of shit, problems to be solved at best. This, of course, annoyed Quincy, who was certain that he would show all of them one day. Dave goes on to say the world is dead and just doesn't know it yet. Dave then reached into his pocket and pulled out a large plastic bag filled with smaller plastic bags, each having heroin in it. That scared Quincy. Dave told him that he didn't steal it, nor did he kill the guy that originally owned it. The guy was already dead and he wouldn't be needing it. When Quincy asked him if that was what the shooting was about, Dave said no, he was blacks away. But shooting ain't gonna help when they come. That guns don't need anything anymore. Quincy then picked up his case of beer and began going up the stairs. He didn't want to be around junkie Dave anymore. That's when he heard Dave say, I can hear it man, I can hear everything you know. Quincy then turned around to yell at Dave, but Dave was gone. Quincy went upstairs, put the case by his door, went into his neighbor's apartment and took his bottle of Sotel Mexican moonshine, then went into his own apartment. He woke up in pain with his throat and his nose burning. He had vomited on himself. He had on headphones from his Walkman playing 90s music and it depressed him because it reminded him he was approaching middle age and had nothing to show for it. He tried to go to the zinc and wash his face but he slipped and fell and hit his head and it just made his headache worse. Then he heard someone calling his name. It was Junkie Dave. Dave spoke to him for a while and then he let Dave inject a needle full of heroin into his arm. Anything to ease the pain. Natalie had only met with Irwin once in his office. That was the day she became his assistant. After that, they almost always met in his BMW. And that's where they were when she told him that she was pregnant. In response, he told her that she needed to think about where she wants to be in five years. He then asked her if there was anyone she could speak to. But she said he was the only one. When he asked her what about back home in Dallas, she told him that she was from Austin. And then he said it is safe and legal there. You know, if that's your plan. When Quincy came to himself, the pain was gone, taken away by junkie Dave and his needle. When he opened his eyes, he realized that he and Dave was walking in the rain, a drizzle. It had not stopped raining since that earthquake on the west coast. They were talking about the people that think they run things. Quincy couldn't remember a single thing about their walk. That's what heroin does to you. And he couldn't remember seeing anyone since he left his place. He looked around and tried to focus. There was nobody on the street besides him and Dave. All the cars were parked at the curb. He told Dave that something was wrong, but Dave just smiled and said, come on man, get in. As he opened up a BMW, he said, let's cook in style. Quincy said, what if the cops come by? Dave just pointed to a cop car across the street and said, I walked past that one on the way to your place last night and it's still there. No cops here now. So he got into the car and let Dave shoot him up. And after a nap, they continued walking. They kept walking and shooting up until they ran into an ambulance with its lights on and the doors open. And next to it was a cop car. And behind the wheel was a young cop who was looking scared. He spoke on the radio, then looked at Dave and Quincy, and then got out of his car with a shotgun. Quincy then told Dave, I think we're about to see some actual shit happen. But Dave responds, nah, nothing happens in the light. The cop was examining the ambulance, looking under it and inside it. The rear doors looked like the handles had been almost twisted off. When Quincy began whispering to Dave, the cop spun around and pointed the shotgun at Quincy. That's when Dave tried to calm the cop down. The cop asked them where they were coming from. Dave told him and the cop asked them if they had seen anyone between here and there. And Quincy said no. And when Quincy asked him why he was asking, the cop didn't answer. He hopped in his car and drove away. When Quincy told Dave that something was wrong, Dave just said, there's nothing wrong. The world is just different. Dave goes on to say that the cops are just puppets, just like you and me used to be before the rapture. But now, you and me, we can see the puppet show and we can hear the soundtrack. What Dave was talking about, Quincy didn't understand and was too high to care at the time. When Quincy came through, he and Dave was in the ambulance. 
and the radio was on giving news. They were talking about the earthquake that had destroyed the West Coast, the flooding along rivers like the Mississippi, the absenteeism at businesses and government agencies, and that emergency funds was made available by the federal government to city services. Quincy tried to tell Dave that we gotta call the cops and tell them that everybody's gone, but Dave said, it's the rapture of the deep. They're all gone, like the dinosaurs, the dodo birds, extinct, like the woolly mammoths. So Quincy called 911 and spoke to the operator, but the operator just kept asking him a few questions, and she asked him if he'd seen anyone driving around or walking around. When he said no, and he asked her why you keep asking that, she hung up. So they grabbed the flashlights that were in the ambulance and headed back to Quincy's place. Next time he comes to himself, Quincy saw that they were walking in the rain headed back to his place. He could see Dave ahead of him with a yellow raincoat that has EMS written on it. And when he checked himself out, he had one too. And both of them were carrying a big black flashlight. That's when Dave called back to him. We got them in the ambulance in case you forgot. And just as they're walking by a dark alley, a loud siren blasted into the night. That's when Dave said he's from one of the dams around here. He's not sure which one. And then Quincy asked him, how did you know I was going to ask that? And Dave said, haven't we always been transparent? I know you have, and me probably to you. They turned and headed down the alley until they got to a garage with a Mercedes sitting in it and a Mac laptop inside the driver's side door. Of course, the car wouldn't start and the computer was dead. Then Quincy heard the rafters creak and groan and he looked in the rearview mirror just in time to see something splash down behind the car and a shadow was gone before he could process it. He asked Dave if he saw that. Dave said yes. Quincy's now beginning to freak out because he's wondering where everybody is, but Dave doesn't seem to worry about it. Then Dave invited him, let's go into the house. So they did. Natalie, of course, was experiencing morning sickness and she knew what Irwin wanted her to do and she was planning to go back to Austin to take care of it. And when she asked him, when I come back, he just nodded and looked at his coffee. She was at the White House once again when she met with Chester Slayton from the NOAA, who was there to try and brief the big man. He complained to her, telling her that he doesn't know why he's here because no one is listening to him, because nothing he says helps anyone politically. So she convinced him that she could help him sell his tale to the right people who would listen to him. So she got the details from him and went back and reported to Irwin. And what he told her and that she relayed to Irwin was that this thing came from Europa, cracking the ice in Europa and coming out and leaving a radiation trail all the way until it hit the Ross Ice Shelf with more force than Tunguska. And of course, Irwin had no idea what Tunguska was or what it referred to. By this time, Quincy and Dave are in the house and as Dave said, it's not breaking and entering if the door is open. And that, of course, is what Quincy was thinking. And he wants to know how Dave is knowing what he's thinking. And Dave said, we're all open books. All you got to do is start reading. Quincy then tells Dave, maybe he should have taken him up on that last shot when he offered it up. But Dave said, we got the knock on, but maybe you shouldn't take that yet. You should hold off a bit. And Quincy thanked him. That's when Dave said, I'm here to serve our new gods and for whatever reason, they want you alive. Quincy, of course, thinks Dave is joking. Quincy heard the same thing that he heard when he was in the garage. When he shined his light on it, something shapeless seems to disappear when the light hit it, and it seemed to launch itself over their heads into the roof of the house. When he mentions it to Dave, Dave sees it but doesn't care, and that's beginning to bother Quincy. Dave then turns on the lights, and Quincy saw how beautiful the house was, And that made him sad because it was everything he could never have because the owners were everything he could never be. Quincy went to explore the rest of the house. He saw that the owners were packing to leave when they disappeared. In the bathroom, there were two pistols with laser scopes and a pile of magazines with hollow point bullets. The tub was filled with water and the water was cloudy and cold and had a smell of ammonia. And it looked like it's been sitting there for a while. Quincy wanted to take a look at the neighboring house, so they headed there, leaving the lights on in this one. In the next house, the situation was the same. The door was unlocked, the lights was off, but they turned them on, and there was a faint smell of ammonia. Dave searching through their dresses 
found a bag of cocaine, but Quincy didn't want them to use it because he wanted his mind clear. He looked in the bathroom and the tub was filled with water. Again, the water was cloudy and it had a smell of ammonia. When they left, Quincy looked at the first house they had visited and he noticed that the lights was now off. Quincy was either dreaming or hallucinating and he wasn't sure which. In his dream, he seems to be in a theater watching a play that was performed by puppets that used to be people. He watched as the puppets built empires and cathedrals only to see them burn and plagues claim their best and brightest. Then he saw the puppeteers. They had giant black eyes and many arms and they showed him that only pain exists and that it all ends in death, that it is better to never have existed, that this has always been the way and this will always be the way. The harvest had happened before and it would happen again when the stars were right and right now the stars were right. Quincy woke up the next day, he had dope sickness and alcohol withdrawal, the worst it has ever been. He had no idea how many days had passed. Junkie Dave was gone but his backpack was still there and he had left a black tar ball on top of some weed in a small pipe for him. He immediately began smoking it. Then he noticed his hands were no longer shaking. That was until he heard something big crawling in the crawl space above him and then he began to shake again and he remembered some of what was going on yesterday or the day before and he remembered the dream. He also remembered that Dave had tens of thousands of dollars in his backpack. When Natalie was told that many airports around the country were closed because there wasn't enough people to run them, she didn't believe it until she landed at Austin Bergstrom International Airport. Then she realized that it was true. There were hundreds of people waiting for baggage because there weren't enough guys to unload the luggage. She couldn't get the rental car she booked because the rental agency was closed as was every other rental agency. When she asked, a TSA agent told her that she should walk a half a mile to the nearest hotel because the shuttle to the hotel wasn't running because no one showed up to drive the van. She looked in the direction where the hotel was supposed to be and she couldn't see anything but she saw a line of people heading that way. But she wasn't going to go there because why would you go to a hotel that's without power? She looked around and saw hundreds of people sleeping on the floor waiting for the next day when things were supposed to get better. But she decided not to stick around here either. She called people on her contact list leaving messages but getting no answer. She was here to have an abortion from a guy who didn't care about her and now she was feeling very alone. Then she heard someone call her name. When she looked around and groaned it was Quincy, a temporary boyfriend. So they went looking for the car he came in, which was Susie's car. He wasn't quite sure if it was a Camry or a Corolla. When they finally found the car, a yellow Camry, she wanted to make sure that he was okay to drive. It was then that he noticed that the lights in the parking lot was going out. He told her, get in, get in now. When she looked to see what was going on, she could see that a light in the far corner of the parking lot was out and she could hear a muffled shouting coming from that area. Then another light went out, and then another. As they drove by the attendant booth, the glass was shattered and the attendant was missing. When they got to the hotel and walked into the lobby, they could see that it was empty, and it was as if someone had mapped the entire lobby with ammonia. The hotel seems completely empty. It should be packed, especially all those people from the airport should have gotten here by now. Then they heard a single scream far above them. Then the lights went out, the uh, conditioner stopped working, so they stood for a second, then turned and ran. Their drive back took them past the terminal, and they noticed that the place was empty. The hundreds of people that were there a little while ago were all gone. They headed over to her abuela's house, and on the way, Quincy told her about all the people that have gone missing. On their way there, she saw that every light of every house was off. Only the street lights were on and the lights outside the houses. And when she got to her abuela's house, it was completely dark. That's when she realized that something was happening, something apart from the earthquakes and tsunamis, something apart from the event. Quincy asked her if she wanted him to go knock on the door. She said yes, crying by this time. He grabbed the flashlight and headed to the door. He knocked on the door and the door swung open and it was dark inside. He went in and she could see his flashlight going as it go towards the back. 
He came back with his shirt covering his nose. He got in the car, didn't look at her. He didn't need to. They drove away. They went over to Star's Cafe where there was one cook and one waitress and just a few people inside, not the big crowds that it usually has. Here in Austin, no one had seen the sun in days and the few people that were in the cafe looked like refugees. After they'd finished eating, Natalie told Quincy she thanked him for what he's done. She needed to be alone. She was going to stay at the hotel behind the restaurant. She went to her appointment and he told her that they were short-staffed and the doctor won't be in until 4 p.m. So they'll take her tomorrow and they'll do the procedure at 6 p.m. Natalie had picked up smoking again at the restaurant. She hadn't smoked in years before this. As she lay down to sleep, she thought about how bad she just treated Quincy. She jumped out of bed. Something woke her. When she listened, she heard it again. Someone was pounding on her door. And the voice was a man, a deranged man saying, You are so beautiful. You are alone among the stars. You are alone in the deep and the dark. You are alone among the stars. When she peeked through the peephole, she saw it was a homeless man. Then she heard a police siren whoop once or twice. Then a voice saying, step away from the... Then a car crashing sound and a screeching, hissing sound. Then she heard automatic gunfire, an M4. She had learned to tell the differences between the sounds. She figured it was a cop and that he emptied two magazines. When she peeped out the blinds, she could see the homeless man wandering around in the parking lot and the cop was gone. She went down into the parking lot and looked at the shell casings. They were full metal jackets, two, two, threes. She wondered why there was only one cop. There should have been a full SWAT team with helicopters by now. She went back into the hotel lobby and she noticed it was empty and it had that ammonia smell. She walked through the hotel knocking on every door. Some swung open, but nobody ever answered and all the rooms were empty. There were no people. She went back to the restaurant and it was now empty. The only reason the smell of ammonia wasn't overpowering was because of the food that was burning on the grill. She made a call to Quincy for him to come and pick her up. They stayed on the phone together as he drove towards her. He told her that not only are all the houses without lights, but the street lights are now all broken. And there are no people, no cats, and no dogs. On their way, they saw in the parking lot of the LBJ library a column of armored vehicles with soldiers and it was obvious that none of these soldiers were here for flood relief. When they got to the Omni Hotel, they realized that Natalie had left her wallet back at the old hotel she was at. So they headed off towards Quincy's place. Still further down that road, they ran into the ambulance. Quincy said it's been sitting there for two days. Then they ran into Luz Marie's taco truck and Quincy stopped and get out to look because he said, she's a friend of mine. Then they heard a rumbling coming down the street and they saw four armored personnel carriers full with soldiers go by them. Since they were afraid that they could be shot for being looters, they decided to take the alleys. Then they saw something dart out in front of them. It didn't run. It seemed to extend across the alley, then snap across too fast to know what its shape was. The only thing they saw about it was its size. It was bigger around than their car and about 30 feet long. Quincy tried to back up, but there was another one going across the alley behind him then some more in front and then two more in the back some things were heading north in mass and then it was over they were all gone then they saw flashes and then they heard automatic cannon fire and tracer rounds went over the houses when everything quieted down they hurried on their way and they passed two strikers armored personnel carriers sitting still in the rain and another one was in headed in the other direction, retreating in reverse. The hatches closed and the gun was blown away or ripped apart. They got back to the parking lot in front of his building and then he told her about the gun. So they got out and got it. She checked to make sure there was any rounds in it and there were four left and decided to go up, get the money and get out of there. When they got into Quincy's apartment, they heard a voice. It was Dave and Natalie almost shot him. It was lucky for him that his safety was on. So while Dave was acting strange and talking about the rapture of the deep and a new beginning, a new era for our world, Natalie figured out the safety and blew him away. After the shooting, Natalie didn't say a word, but Quincy got her back downtown and up 
on the 12th floor of a hotel after they checked in. Soldiers had the east side crossings all blacked off. They had also blacked the southbound traffic on the freeway. Quincy sat down on the bed and opened up Dave's backpack and pulled out a bag of drugs and some syringes. And he told Natalie, it's either this or he has to drink. And she sat next to him and offered her arm. Natalie was asleep and having a nightmare. And when she woke up, she came to the realization that she had killed a man. She and Quincy had had sex. She let him shoot her up full of dope so she couldn't feel. And when she began to get afraid, he shot some more dope into her once again. It made the fear and the guilt go away. When Quincy woke up the next morning and he looked out, everything was the same. The sleeve was blacked off, the east side was blacked off, and the army was roaming around looking for something. As she headed out for her appointment, she asked the concierge if there was any way she can get to the airport, and he told her that she would need to go to Dallas, that the local airport and the airport in San Antonio were now inaccessible. Apparently, San Antonio, this whole city was inaccessible. There wasn't any newspapers, and the internet was down. So as she was headed towards her appointment, she was thinking that, what a screw-up he was, and how did an idiot like him ever graduate high school? And he looked at her and said, I didn't graduate high school. They went in, went up to their floor, slipped into the woman's room, and then shot up. She went into the room, and finally the doctors came to perform the procedure. And while it was being done, she said to herself, to God, I'm so sorry. And just as the procedure was finished, she smelled the strongest scent of ammonia ever. When she was finished, she stayed there for a little while, and then she got up and began looking around for people, for the doctor, for the nurse. But there was no one. They were all gone. She walked down the hall, knocking on doors. There was no one. And in the last room, she heard something snap. And when she stepped in and looked up, she saw one of the ceiling tiles fall into place. Something had pulled itself up into the space above the ceiling. She heard a shuffling up there, and then a blast of that ammonia smell hit her. Then she went out and found Quincy asleep in the chair. She kicked at his feet and told him, we need to get out of here now. She told him that we'll drive west. And he said, yeah, west, we'll drive west. And that is how the first story ends. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.